Okay. So, uh, last class, we had uh, talked about voltage, um, also known as electric potential difference, also known as electric potential, commonly referred to as potential. Um, but those four different phrases are all representing this idea that the amount of energy necessary to move a charged particle through a electric field is represented by this voltage. So it's energy divided by the charge that's being moved, the unit charge, the test charge. Um, that's, that's the idea behind this. So we have a new unit, which is the capital V volt, uh, which is basically the joule per coulomb given from this above equation, which is energy divided by charge. And the important detail is that only changes in potential. The fundamental assumption, even though the voltage is usually shown as just a capital V by itself, it should always be understood to be with, ref with reference to something else. Now, for our purposes, it's usually with reference to infinity or with reference to the charge itself. Um, you get the same result either way, but it's essentially the difference between two points. And because of the fact that the amount of energy it takes to move that charge can be also expressed as the amount of work uh, and the relationship between change of potential energy is equal to negative work, we can also write voltage as negative work divided by charge. So that's, that's one half of the concept that the amount of work necessary to move the charge is um, proportional to the voltage. The other equation, the other half of it, which is simultaneously true, is the voltage is equal to the electric field times the distance that the charge moves through the electric field. So in this case, there's no charge that's moving. This is simply a, when there's an electric field presence, you tick two points in that field, and there's a voltage difference between those two points. That's essentially what this means. But that voltage can be understood as how much energy it takes to move the particle through that field. So it follows the field lines. Uh, and whenever we have uh, a bunch of field lines, I think I'll repeat this in a minute. When you're on the high field side, oh, I'm sorry, when you're on the positive side of the plate, that's high potential. When you're on the negative side of the plate, that's low potential. So generally speaking, it's always high poten potential at the plus side. It's always low potential at the, the negative side. So if you've got a plate of charge or individual charges or just one charge hanging out by itself, um, this, is, this is your guide for what is, um, what is high potential, what is low potential. Now, that being said, potential energy is proportional to not only the potential, it's also proportional to the sign of the charge being moved. Um, because of the fact that the change in potential energy is QED, uh, which is that force times distance, uh, or the charge through E, if your charge is positive, this sign stays the same. If your charge is negative, if you've got a negative charge here, then the negative will cause, this will end up being written as minus, minus Q, so a negative charge will flip the sign. And so that's the mathematics. But the concept is if you have a negative charge next to a group of negative charges, it's not going to want to be there. It's going to want to repel and fire off over to the left side where the positive charges are because of that repulsion. Therefore, this is a high potential energy for a, um, so this is high PE for a negative charge but low PE on this side for a positive charge. And just use this concept of what does a charge prefer to do to understand whether it is in a high potential energy or low potential energy situation. But the electric potential is fixed. It's always high on the positive side, it's always low on the negative side. Questions about this idea? Okay, so uh, we've talked about the work and I think I had a clicker question, which if memory serves, 
uh, you have not done because the answer was already shown. But let's take a moment and look at this one. So I've got a proton and an electron sitting between two electric plates. The proton sitting at the positive side, the electron sitting at the negative side. So my proton is sitting here, with a happy plus on it. The electron is sitting on the negative side. They are both released. Um, which one of them, actually without being released, they're just sitting there, which one feels the larger electric force? So I'll open up the poll question. So in this situation, which one of them feels the larger electric force? Is it the proton, is it the electron? Do they feel the same force? Is there no force? Or do they feel the same magnitude force, but they're pointed in opposite directions? Um, I have a quick question. So yeah. I know the poll answer is more than one. So like, is it two answers or one answer? Uh, there is one answer. Okay, thank you. All right, so uh, last person check in if you haven't, thank you. Okay, so our results. 14 uh, go with E, that they feel the same magnitude, but in opposite directions. Uh, two people went with, uh, three people went with proton and electron. So the correct answer is E. Um, F is equal to Q times E. The electric field is the same for both. The charge magnitude on the proton and electron is identical. Therefore, they both have the same force. But because of the fact that the proton is repelled from the positive charge, the electron is repelled from the negative charge. Uh, therefore, they will go in opposite directions. Now, next question. Put my drawings. Um, I have, again, proton electron sitting in this uh, plate. You release the proton from the positive, the electron from the negative side. We know now that their forces are equal. Next question, which has the larger acceleration? And remember, the proton is about 2,000 times bigger and heavier than the electron. When you're asking like larger, do you mean faster? Uh, faster is velocity, that's meters per second. Acceleration, um, which comes from Newton's second law, the acceleration is um, a measure of how quickly its velocity will change over time. Okay, yeah, 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 thank you. All right, last three people check in. Give another five seconds. Three, two, thank you. All right, vast majority went with electron, you are correct. So uh, you have, sorry. So you've got F equals MA. So your acceleration is force divided by mass. The force is the same for both, but the electron being much smaller, uh, as you know, smaller in the denominator means larger total. So um, that makes the uh, electron experience a larger acceleration. It's lighter, 
it's easier to, to speed up and get on its way. So therefore it, it responds more quickly with a larger acceleration. All right, now third one, again, electrons and protons, um, same situation. When it arrives at the opposite plate, which one has more kinetic energy? Is it the proton or the electron? Is it uh, the, they both acquire the same amount of kinetic energy? Or is there no change of kinetic energy? Or they acquire the same kinetic energy, but with opposite signs? So if the, if the electron accelerates faster, uh, would its velocity also be greater? Yes. But the proton has much more mass. You got it. Okay. So go back to the idea of conservation of energy and think about what's happening here uh, in terms of kinetic energy versus what's happening in terms of potential energy. Um, would the signs matter in it? Uh, would the signs matter in terms of this? That That is what I'm asking you to, to know. Oh. To, to be able to consider. Okay, you let me read the question again. So it's the same situation. Proton, electron, it's a constant electric field. They both see the same electric field. They both see the same um, force. Their accelerations are different because of their different masses. But now we're basically saying they will shoot from the plate they're repelled from towards the plate they're attracted to over a certain distance. We don't know what it is. But when it arrives at the opposite plate, which one has more kinetic energy? Okay, last two people check in. So we got you in three, two, thank you. Okay, so we were um, all over the map here. Uh, some people said it's the proton, some people said it's the electron. Uh, a few people said it's both acquire the same. So let's take a moment and look at what we know, right? We know that PE is equal to QV, right? So both charges have the same voltage. Both charges have the same Q, right? So their potential energy is the same. Let me see if I can get a better color. There we go, nice contrast. So anybody remember what the equation for conservation of energy is? Is it uh, kinetic energy final minus kinetic energy initial equals potential energy final minus kinetic uh, potential energy initial? So you have Ke final minus Ke initial equals Pe final minus Pe initial. Now, another way to write this would be PE initial plus KE initial equals PE final plus KE final. I ignore the uh, parenthesis there, it's supposed to be an underscore. So my kinetic energy, the difference in kinetic energy is equal to the difference in the potential energy, which is the second equation. The third equation down basically means that my potential plus kinetic is equal to the potential plus kinetic at a later point in time, meaning there's no loss of energy or gain of energy in a conservative system, um, which for electrical systems, it's conservative. 
So there's no, there's no loss of energy. Based on this knowledge, what should have been the correct answer? Would it be electron? Why? Because the equation is one half mv squared and the velocity would be a lot faster for the electron? It would be. But the, the proton electron has small. greater mass than the electron. Right. But it's a uh, V squared, so. Right, so you're saying that Ke is equal to one half MV squared. Right. So you're saying that the electron having a smaller mass will have a greater speed. Yes. Okay, so going to this first equation, If my change in potential energy is exactly equal to my change in kinetic energy, and my potential energy has nothing to do with mass, it's only the amount of charge on it and the amount of voltage it's experiencing. If my change in energy from the electron moving through the voltage potential um, is fixed, as a certain amount, and it's exactly equal to the kinetic energy, does the proton and the electron experience a different potential energy or do they experience the same potential energy? The same. And by the conservation of energy, they must have the same kinetic energy. I don't get how, I don't get how that works. <laughs> Straight up, I'm just going to be honest. I don't understand it. All right, fair enough. So let's. Uh, um, so let's work it. Let's say that we have V is equal to 100 volts, right? Um, and let's find out the velocity. Daddy, I have class till six o'clock. What? I have class till six o'clock. That's what time? Six o'clock, Daddy. After okay, Sharina, I'm muting you. <laughs> so, um, all right, so it, work it out. I'm so sorry. If, if let's find the velocity for uh, the proton, let's find the velocity for the electron. So the uh, mass of the electron is 9.11 times 10 to the minus um, 31 kilograms. And the mass of the proton is equal to 1.627 uh, times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. So let's, let's, let's do that. Um, who wants to how about, uh, I don't know, let's see what we've got here. Um, how about uh, Patrick, Marwa, and Sharina? Why don't you guys do the um, velocity for the electron? And uh, Jared, Hannah, and uh, Ben, why don't you guys do the velocity of the proton? All right. I got to go grab my calculator. I'll write down the theoretical. Our velocity is going to be equal to the square root of two times Q times V over M. So your Q is, of course, 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19. Your voltage is 100. I will ratio on my calculator. So I got two 
that one. All right, so now let's compare the KEs. I think I've got the kinetic energy of the electron. Go for it. I got 2.71 times 10 to the negative 24th joules. Okay. And we got the proton. I did the kinetic energy for both, but I got 1.61 e to the negative 17 for both. That actually is closer to the correct answer. So, um, uh, Jared, I'd check your work on the, the first one. Or who did the first one? Was that Patrick or Jared? That was me. Okay, um, so I think you've got a um, you've got you've got a uh, um, you're off by a factor of six. So my answer was somewhere in the one point six one, because if you if you convert this um, back to volts, you should get. Um, you can get about a hundred electron volts. Oh uh, yeah, I didn't. I didn't square my velocity. That'll do you. All right, so that is now your answer. We have, this is your kinetic energy for the electron. This is your kinetic energy for the proton. They're the same. So the masses are different and the velocities are different. So the proton's much heavier, but its speed is much slower. But when you multiply mass times velocity squared, you get a kinetic energy of 1.61 times 10 to the negative 17. Your electron is lighter, but it moves much faster. When you multiply mass times velocity squared, you get 1.61 times 10 to the negative 17. So they get the same kinetic energy. Anybody have any questions? No, I don't think so. All right. So 
Um, now, just a quick um, reminder. So if you've got an electron close to the negative side of a parallel plate capacitor indicated by the blue dot there with a negative, what is your expectation? What will, what will it do? As I've already mentioned, uh, it'll want to just fire off to the left. It'll want to approach that other plate. Um, it's being accelerated. Your potential energy equations, K plus um, K plus U, um, sorry, this should have been K, Ke plus Pe um, is equal to Ke plus Pe. So uh, if there is a change in potential energy, there must be a change in kinetic energy. That is the, the essential idea of conservation of energy. Sorry, my brain just froze. Um, so for this case, does the potential energy for the electron increase or decrease? I, I would think like the further left it moves, the more the potential energy decreases. Yep. So it's, um, well, it's, it's, yes. So it's potential energy uh, is at its lowest when it's right next to the positive side, which is where it wants to be. The potential energy is largest uh, when it is on this side, where it is really not wanting to be. It wants to be um, far away from it. So the potential energy can also be understood. It's decreasing because the kinetic energy is increasing. So if it starts at rest here, as it shoots across, it's gonna gain speed and get faster and faster until it plows into the plate on the left. So the kinetic energy is increasing, so therefore the potential energy is decreasing. It's really no different than dropping a stone in the gravitational field. Um, at, as the stone falls, it gains speed because its potential energy is being converted into kinetic energy. So um, if it was like a positive charge, on the left side, yep. then going to the right would be a decreasing the potential energy and increasing the kinetic energy, right? Yes, yep. Okay, all right, makes sense. Okay, so what's the rule for this electric potential difference? Um, if you go with the field, meaning that you go, now I wanna make the difference, we've talked about potential energy, but the thing is, is that high potential, as I said, always sticks on the high end. Low potential for electric potential always sticks to the negative end. But supposing you don't know where the positive and negative charges are, supposing you're just given something like an arrow and you're told that an electric field follows this direction. So if your particle is going with the field, meaning it's going in the direction of the arrow, then your potential is your potential <coughs> um, is decreasing. If you're going against the field, then your potential is increasing in terms of potential difference. Is that only for positively charged particles or does that apply for negatively charged particles too? Uh, it applies for negatively charged particles as well. So when, it, when we talk about electric potential difference. My negative charge here is at a low potential side. Uh, let, let's make it, let's make it, it's at, it's at the low V side. When it moves over here, its potential energy goes from high potential energy to low potential energy, but this side is still the high V side. The voltage, difference remains the same. High potential is always with the positives, low potential is always with the negatives, but the potential energy switches. Based on the sign, does that make sense? Yes. Okay. All right, let's take a quick example. So I have an electric field, uh, which is determined from the voltage. I've got two parallel plates um, that are charged so that one plate is 50 volts, the other plate is zero. 
if the separation between them is a half meter, what is the electric field between the plates? So I'll give you guys a second to take a look at your notes, pull out the right equation and calculate for me the electric field. So give me a check mark in the participants tab when you've got it. Okay, I've got two people, three. Relatively simple problem. All right, so let me uh, call out a few people. Uh, Caitlin, Shagufa, Sanjana, how are you guys doing? Any questions on the process? Yeah, I think, so is the, I don't know if like it's a trick question, because I think, Not. If, okay, is it the V equals ED equation? Yep. Okay. I felt the same way. I felt like it was suspiciously easy. <laughs> well, the thing is, is when you're learning something for the first time, the first few questions are deliberately easy to get you used to connecting the vocabulary and the concepts to the formula. So in this particular one, it's just V is equal to ED. You've only got the three formulas, which is just um, potential uh, is connected to voltage, potential is replaced by work, and then electric field connected to uh, potential. Uh, those are your three equations, and then you throw in the conservation of energy. So uh, 50 volts divided by a distance of half a meter, it's a 1,000 volts. Um, that's all there is to it. Now, um, I want to mention this. It's a little out of sequence. We'll come back to this late in uh, Chapter 19, the dielectric breakdown of air. Um, if you have a number uh, that is bigger than 3 million volts, and we're talking about something that's happening in air, you've got a mistake. The electric field cannot exceed this value uh, because as soon as it does, uh, the air breaks down, you get a plasma line, uh, and charge basically travels along that line of glowing plasma, and that's what lightning is. Uh, it's the same thing you see when you, when you shock your finger on a doorknob or when we talked about the Van de Graaff, those little arcs of the lightning that were happening from the Van de Graaff to the, um, the stick, that was the um, dielectric breakdown of air. So I just bring that up to make you aware of 3 million is the limit that air can handle for electric field. So another version, I've got an electron in a television, the one of those old big square televisions with a cathode ray tube buried in it. Um, it is accelerated. Uh, between two plates, so it now has been given a, a voltage difference of 5,000 volts. And we ask, what is the change in the electrical potential energy of the electron? 
So the electrical potential energy is just QV, right? So you multiply QV and that difference is 5,000. So you end up with 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19. That's the charge on electron times 5,000 volts. And you get this number, which is 8.0 times 10 to the negative 16 um, coulombs times volts or equivalently joules. So the minus sign indicates that the potential energy has decreased because it has just been given a, uh, a hit of speed to give it kinetic energy. Now, now that we know what its change in potential is, what is its kinetic energy? So for this one, we know from conservation of energy, it has to be equal to the potential energy change. So we write out just to be thorough, this is our conservation of energy equation. Those components that are happening before are equal to those components that are happening afterwards. Or we can rewrite it so that the total change in potential before is equal to the total change in kinetic after. Um, and so in this case, uh, there's no potential afterwards, so that goes to zero. There's no kinetic afterwards, so that goes to zero. So we just have PE initial is equal to KE final, which gives us then this equation our change in potential energy is equal to one half mv squared. But our change in potential energy is just QV. We've already calculated it. So we pull out our final equation. Our kinetic energy is one half mv squared. Our potential energy is QV. We put them together and we get that equation we just did for uh, the clicker questions where we have the velocity is equal to minus two QV uh, times cap, two QV uh, divided by M. So since it's an electron, it's 9.11. Um, and we end up getting this expression. So 4.2 times 10 to the seven uh, is the speed with which this particle will move. Uh, 42 million meters per second. Now that may seem like a very fast speed to you, but I can tell you that electrons are very easy to accelerate because they're so tiny. Um, and therefore they, they, they move to tremendous speeds uh, fairly rapidly. Any questions on the process of what we're doing here? So this is one of the main algorithms, this is one of the main steps that you're gonna end up looking at for the homework and for the exam. Uh, expect that I will definitely have some sort of a conservation of energy type problem uh, included on the exam. All right, moving on. Next question, what potential difference is needed to stop an electron that already has an initial velocity of six times 10 to the five meters per second? So a way of visualizing this, imagine if you will, that we have a plate and that plate is covered in negative charges. like so, then we have a, a second plate. This one now has a hole in it. And a set of positive charges on that. So essentially we're gonna end up with a article with a negative charge in the middle of it. That is shooting in this direction with an initial velocity V. Okay, so that's your setup. You got some positive plates, you got some negative plates. The electron is basically shooting into, um, into the gap with six times 10 to the fifth meters per second. Um, what potential difference on these plates is necessary for that electron to come to a complete stop before it hits the negative plate? So 
I'll let you guys work this out based on your current knowledge. So uh, give me a check mark when you have come up with something. Now, here's my question. Do you guys want to do this in breakout rooms so you can talk to each other? Do you want me to ask any questions? Or is everybody all right? Anybody wants to give me a, 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 an X if they're, if they're stuck, they don't know what to do? Give me a check mark when you're done. Okay, definitely getting a lot more X's than anything else. All right, so let me take a moment and remind you, we have these equations. We have uh, PE is equal to QV. We have um, KE final minus KE initial is equal to PE final minus PE initial. We have KE is equal to one half MV squared. Um, we have work is equal to minus QV. Okay, uh, those are our equations. Right? Those are what we have to play. We have a uh, expression for kinetic energy, which is based on mass and velocity. We have a expression for potential energy, which is based on Q times V. So there are no other equations so far in this chapter. You're asked, what is the potential difference given a speed of six times 10 to the five meters per second? What is the process you should go through to solve this? Should we start with the um, kinetic energy formula? Yes. Okay, and then we go to the KEF minus KEI. Yep. One, and then solve through it. Okay, I can, I can follow it through now. Thank you. Yeah, so the KEF, the final value is zero because we're going to stop the electron. And then the, your difference in the potential, um, that is what we don't know. But we can rewrite it to be equal to minus Q times V final minus V initial. Because we're not asked for the difference in potential energy, we're asked for the difference in potential. Oh, except I may have a typo, sorry. Equals Q, the final minus the initial. All right, so one more time, give me 
Give me a check mark when you have an answer. Give me an X if you are still stuck. Dr. Jackson, isn't that the same as just using the first equation? The one, uh, yes. So you can use the first equation to solve it? Yep. Okay. But you have to basically take the third equation, the first equation, and put them into the second equation, and then you can solve it. All right, so give me a check mark when you're done. Give me an X if you are stuck. All right, we got three, three check marks. Ah, oh, ah, oh, ah. Oh. All right, let me, uh, let me change the rules of the participants. Give me a check mark if you are working on it. Give me an X if you are waiting for somebody else to come up with the answer so you don't have to. Okay, thank you. All right, I'm gonna clear the feedback. Give me a check mark if you're done. All right, so I have about six or so. All right, so let me come up with, I got a value of about uh, one volt. So the voltage is MV squared over two Q. Um, we have an electron, so it's 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31 times six times 10 to the five meters per second squared, which is 10 to the 10 at the end of the day. So you end up this negative 10 to the 31 becomes negative 21. You divide it by um, 10 to the 19. Uh, collectively, you end up with a value that's about one volt. Anybody disagree with that? Okay, so let me um, go back up one. 
what what had to happen in order to properly understand this? Number one, I highly recommend make a diagram to make sure that you understand the physical properties, the physical setup of what's happening. Um, whenever we're talking about a potential difference, that means there is a set of negative charges, there's a set of positive charges somewhere that are creating a condition where this object is going to enter that field. Um, and then we have to, if it's asking, if it's giving us something that involves velocity, then that will involve the conservation of energy. Um, that's basically one of your dead giveaways. If it's asking for velocity or if you're given a velocity, that means it's kinetic energy. If it's kinetic energy, it means there's conservation of energy. That's the connection you're looking to make. All right, so Ali asked a question, why isn't it negative? So, um, good question, because I utilize this, um, because I utilize my equation here and my PE is equal to positive um, QV, the electron, will have a negative E charge, which you're right, absolutely should have um, put in a negative. And so, yes, there should have been a negative in there. Um, typo on my end, thank you, Ollie, good catch. All right, so what's the difference between problem number three and the one we did before? So if we go back upward here to this one, uh, what's the difference? they're the same problem, they're just in reverse, right? So the first problem was you're given the voltage and you're asked to find the speed. In the second problem, you're given the speed, you're asked to find the voltage, right? That's it, it's the same problem, just in reverse. So be aware that if I give you a problem, uh, this could be the way that it, it will set up and, and be organized. Uh, that I, whatever problem I give you in the homework, I can give you the same problem, just in the reverse direction. Not that many tricks. Okay, so my next question is, uh, does anybody have any last questions on this before we move forward? Um, just one quick question. No. Um, would mostly, um, for example, like the PE initial or PE final and then the KE, -E, like one of them be zero at all times, ending up making the equation one half MV square is equal to QV in most of the situations? Uh, in these problems, yes, but not necessarily so. Okay, makes sense. All right, thank you. So you could move from a, um, so you, for instance, you could start at a 10 volt potential and move to a 50 volt potential. So the difference between them was 40. Mm -hmm. um, and then you would um, talk about what was the change of speed because of that. Or you could say that something went from um, uh, 6 million meters per second and slowed down to 1 million meters per second. What potential was necessary to make that change of speed. Okay, makes sense. Mm -hmm. So the, the key to success is be methodical, write out the full equation, identify what ones you know, what ones you don't. If they're zero, that's helpful. If they're not, you just live with it. Uh, but you, you always are paying attention to the difference and um, the different versions of the conservation of energy, either this one where the kinetic plus potential is together equal to the kinetic plus potential afterward, or you've got the change in kinetic is equal to the change in uh, potential. Either, either way you do it. Um, just be aware that, that uh, you wanna be careful about identifying what is known, what is unknown. Okay, so I'm gonna pop over to the equipotential lines and surfaces. This concept, which is the last one we get to before we get to capacitors, um, equipotential lines are basically always perpendicular to the electric field. Now, um, I've only asked you guys to know how to set up electric fields for points charges, and um, the assumption is that you understand that the electric field inside of parallel plates is always um, uniform. It's always the same pointing from the positive to the negative. So when we talk about these equipotential lines, essentially the potential is always going to be the same at every point. So when we talk about this equation, 
V is equal to E times D, right? What this means is that if this distance is one meter, right? Well then my total voltage from the zero volt side to the positive side, that's gonna be um, 20 volts, right? But if I draw a line down the middle, this line right there, that equipotential line is gonna be along the 10 volt line because my voltage will be now the electric field times a half meter. So you'll end up with half the voltage. If I draw the line here, then my voltage is gonna be electric field times a quarter of a meter. So I'll have a, a 0.25 difference between the plate and that line. So that's, that's our idea here. And no matter what difference we pick, the electric field will still give us the same uniform constant value between those two plates. Um, so that's why we have this 20, 15, 10, five, and zero, because we just break up that parallel plate into its divisions and we can estimate the difference in voltage between two different locations as we're moving along. Um, but because it's uniform, it'll be nice and linear according to that equation. Now, the equipotentials are always parallel to the surface of a conductor. So if the conductor is flat, convenient for us, we get these nice parallel lines. Um, and the electric field lines are always perpendicular to these equipotentials. But if you get something a little bit more complex, like for instance, two negative charges. So this one here is negative. This one here is also negative. Um, our closest equipotentials are about negative 10 volts. Our next one out is about minus five volts. The furthest one is negative two volts. So we're, we're moving, the, the, the voltage value is decreasing as we're moving further and further away. Eventually you'll find some line out here where V equals zero right, which ideally would be out at infinity, but it's some far distance away. So based on these equipotential lines, I can take one look at it and say, okay, my electric field line will come in perpendicular here, bend and come in perpendicular here, and that will be my electric field line. My electric field line over here will come in perpendicular, bend, come in perpendicular and do this, right, or come in straight. Um, like that. So that's that's basically what this represents. It's essentially a another representation of how the potential is different at different locations. And the equipotential line diagram on the left, this is much cleaner and easier to look at than this thing, right? So the potential surface diagram um, is simply another way of representing where the electric field is and how strong it is. Whether the electric field arrows are pointing out or in will depend on the sign of the voltage at that particular location. Now, another thing to think about, we can imagine if we have a dipole arrangement where we have a negative charge over here and a positive charge over here. So this one's negative, this one's positive, separated by a distance D. Well, our positive basically is um, a very large potential. Our negative is a very um, negative. It's, it's, it's large magnitude, but negative. So when we represent the equipotential lines around these two um, shapes, We'll basically say, okay, I've got an equipotential. No, let's make it red. Thank you. So I'll say, okay, I've got my first equipotential line. And then I'll say, I've got my, my next equipotential line, but it's now going to be um, spread out a little bit. Then I'll have my third equipotential line. That's going to be spread out even further. Same with this one. So that'll be relatively circular. And then as we get a little bit further out, it's going to be more spread. As we get a little bit further out, it's going to be more spread like that. Let's see if I can get this. All right, not quite. Uh, but eventually, there will be somewhere along there will be a line that just goes straight down the middle between them. 
uh, that'll be the line where V equals zero. Um, so our potential drawn in two dimensions with the red and black can be understood with this three dimensional representation where the positive can be seen as a upward contour map and the negative can be seen as a downward contour map. So essentially, we can imagine that these potential charges, the, these electrical charges of positive and negative can have around them a potential zone that um, gives us a visual approximation of what will happen. So if I take a, um, if I take a positively charged particle, actually, let me do it this way. If I take a positively charged particle, like so, uh, it says with a plus on it. So I take a positively charged particle with a plus on it. On this diagram, it's fairly clear that that particle will want to travel away from the positive and go down toward the negative, right? That gives us this, this three-dimensional representation and it makes it fairly obvious. Now, a negative particle would see this the reverse. The negative particle would see the negative as the tall peak and the positive as the low, the low uh, dip. But that's a, just simply a different way of representing this. Another way to think about it is it's kind of like a contour map. So, um, for instance, the Devil's Tower uh, in Montana, Wyoming, sorry, um, is a geographical landform uh, a, a volcanic origin. And it's a just a vertical um, upward flat topped hill. But if we look at the, um, the contour map here, this shows us the elevations. And each line represents one, um, one value of the elevation. So you can tell how tall the tower is by looking at the contour map. Um, and each dark line represents, I don't know, 100 feet, something like that. Um, so we would imagine that water on here would then flow down from there and it would take the path of greatest descent. Uh, so the, the, the flow that water would take would be perpendicular to the contour lines. Um, similarly, the way that electric field is perpendicular to the potential. Anybody have any um, questions about that connection? Does that make sense? So for those of you who don't know, uh, there's a movie called Close Encounters of the Third Kind with Richard Dreyfuss and Terry Garr. Um, fun movie uh, from the late 70s, I believe, 78, 79, 80. Um, but anyway, this, this um, mountain here was the uh, major plot point uh, to it. So it's a fun movie. I, I, it's well made. I'd check it out if you get a chance. Um, all right, so this is our two-dimensional representation, but again, you can imagine that this positive peak is pointing outward. You can imagine that the negative one is pointing inward. So you can imagine a, a positively charged particle. Uh, if this is positive, this is negative, that that particle will want to go in this direction. Or equivalently, if you have a negative charged particle, that negative particle will want to go this way, right? It'll just want to head out uh, along the path. But it will, given the strength of it, it will, it will probably want to bend around and go this way. Okay, so show me what you know. I've got three particles. The blue one is positive, the two yellow ones are negative. There are lines around them that are contour lines representing the equipotentials uh, around these charges. There are five points listed, A, B, C, D, and E. Which one of these will an electron have the greatest possible electric potential energy? A, B, C, D, or E. And it's 550 or almost.
All right, last four people check in, please. Make a choice. Give me five more seconds. Three, two, one, going without you. Okay, so the vast majority of you picked E. So you said that an electron, which has a negative charge, sitting here at point E, that's going to be, that's going to experience the greatest repulsion. Is that the argument you're making? Wouldn't it be attraction since that's a positive charge? It would. So if it's attracted to that location, would it have a high potential energy or a low potential energy? Positive is always higher potential, right? Yes, it is. Wouldn't it have a greater potential energy from trying to repel from a negative charge? It would. So point D is where it would have its greatest potential energy. Point D has the lowest potential, but it has the highest potential energy for an electron. Point E would have the highest potential energy for a proton because a proton would not want to be there. So essentially what I did is I took the parallel plate problem and I put it in a different configuration. And I'm presenting you with uh, a similar set of questions, but it just looks different. All right, so think about that. Um, I'm going to jump out. So, oh, ah, stop it.